Welcome. You are listening to KZSC's Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I'm your host, Silvana Falcón. Today, I'm in the studio with Rebecca Covarrubias, Assistant Professor of Psychology from UC Santa Cruz. Professor Covarrubias graduated with a Bachelor of Science from the University of Arizona, where she was also a Ronald E. McNair Achievement Scholar. As a first-generation college graduate, born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, Dr. Covarrubias helped launch UC Santa Cruz's first generation initiative to raise visibility of the first generation community here at UC Santa Cruz. Welcome, Rebecca, to KCSC's Voces Críticas. Thank you. Excited to be here. So tell us about the hashtag first generation campaign that you helped launch here that is happening throughout the UC system. What is the purpose of the campaign beyond questions of visibility for first generation students, which for folks who don't know, that refers to students who are first in their families to go to college. What is it about this? This campaign that is so important to you. I should mention that the campaign started at UC Irvine with Anita Casavantes Braffer, who's a faculty member there, and then the UC campuses sort of picked it up as this response, I think, to an important cultural shift that's happening on our campuses nationwide, right? But particularly in the UC system, where we're having this larger number of first-gen students. So it's an exciting shift, and I think the campaign is really our response. It's a first-step kind of response, right, to sort of show students that, you know, we're here, we want you here, right, you belong here. And importantly, it identifies, again, sort of points of contact for sort of first points of contact for students to come and sort of express what are they going through, right? What are their stories? And so there's some power, I think, in, sh- in story sharing and, and shared experience. And I think these people, sort of fac- first-gen faculty, alumni, staff, graduate students, offer important templates about how to navigate the university. It is a visibility campaign, but there's so much more, I think, that can be evolved in this. So can you tell us a bit what programming you guys have planned for this year? Again, that's the really exciting part. What happened is that while we all picked up the visibility campaign, a lot of the UC campuses are now doing their own programming, right? So specifically at UC Santa Cruz, what we're working on now is developing a staff training and workshop in the spring where we're inviting Rashna Jahangir, who is a leading researcher on first-gen issues in communities, to facilitate some of that training so that folks can know more about first-gen issues and how it relates to some of the practices and policies in their daily local context. And then we're also working on developing a faculty workshop, and we're partnering with the Center for Innovations in Teaching and Learning. And so that's exciting because we have a group of core faculty who are there and we can engage in some of these conversations about how we can use some of the research to inform our pedagogy and practice. What's really awesome though is that we've had a lot of interest just amongst students. So right now we've targeted right so faculty, staff, and alumni and graduate students, but undergraduate students want to be a part of this. So our immediate next steps within this quarter are to meet with student leaders who are first gen themselves and hear from them about what they want, what they need, and what they would like to see on campus, particularly from the folks who've identified themselves. So it's great. And so why do you you think this link between first-gen faculty and first-gen students that that's going to be happening this year, why is that relationship so critical for student success or student retention, really? Yeah, and I think this is really the crux of the visibility campaign, right? So one of the line of works that we do in my research lab is around representations, right? So social representations, and that really is about how you see yourself represented or if you see yourself represented in learning contexts. And what's key about the visibility campaign is that it's highlighting folks in the learning context and saying that these are important representations for you here, right? That you do belong here because we have templates of people who have been successful in these spaces. And so I think it's really about heightening those positive representations for students and also so students can connect with faculty to learn more about not only the classroom experience, but beyond the classroom, mentoring beyond that. On the flip side, though, I also think that it's immensely important for faculty, right? So now students can come to them and share more about their experience and expertise and so that us as educators, we can start to develop and also respond more to what those needs are and become better at doing what we do, right, to serve students. And so based on your research and based on the experience thus far with the campaign, what would you say are some of the most pressing needs facing first-generation undergraduate students on our campus? And just as sort of context, in fall 2016, the university reported that about 42% of our students identified themselves as first-generation. I think there's two things that I would probably share here. The first is that in many and most of my conversations with first-gen students, there's the need that most comes up in these conversations is around financial need. So for example, 
example, the pressure or the stress over covering the cost of living, particularly in Santa Cruz, because it is very、um, expensive to live here, paying for food, paying for tuition. These types of needs, I think students are expressing and often express experiences of food insecurity. And so the students, in order to respond, they're working multiple jobs, trying to not only make ends meet, but also many times contributing to family members back at home. So I think there is a really severe need for financial resources. And I think there's ways that faculty and staff can respond to this. So, one way in particular is that I think faculty should learn holistically about students, like what stressors are they encountering, so that when appropriate, you can make some flexibility in the structure of your course without lowering expectations. So, that's not really what I'm saying here, right? It's really about being adjusting and, and sort of flexible with how students are dealing with this really important part and need that they have, and also ensuring that they can be successful in the course. I think, particularly because we're at UC Santa Cruz and we're a research institution, there's a really great Opportunity for faculty to fund students to research. And I think that's a great way of developing students not only research development and professional development, but then offering them a need that they need, right? So pay them to do this. So, for example, just in my lab alone, and I know there's many labs on campus that have a similar model, we worked with a team of students, so four undergraduate students. It was more than that, but we got four funded. And we had mentors and the students put together applications for the UCSC Cora Undergraduate Research Award. And four students were funded, two mentors, and this was about close to $11,000. But what was really exciting is that now you can alleviate some of that need to work to then hone in on this skill that sort of gives them a different opportunity. So there's the financial need, I think, is most I think that comes up. My work is really centered around the cultural need, right? The sort of cultural transition to college. And I think that's really about how we can help students navigate this entirely new language, new space, new system, new rules that are not obvious, right? That are very hidden, very subtle. And as faculty, especially through the First Gen Initiative, I think it's our responsibility and our sort Of honor, right? To really share what that template could look like, what that roadmap could look like. And those happen in the daily conversations. So, when you say cultural changes and cultural challenges, what, let's unpack that a little bit in terms of what you meant. You've mentioned the vocabulary, you've mentioned the institution as being a bit of a peculiar system, right? A peculiar kind of culture and a peculiar place. So, specifically, what are the cultural challenges? Is it understanding how the system works? Is it understanding things like the financial aid process? Like, what cultural aspects are you specifically referring to? Yeah. I mean, I think there's those things, right? So just navigating the system itself and trying to negotiate all the sort of bureaucratic details. And I think we have really good counselors and advisors that help with those things. I'm talking more about the subtle kind of cultural expectations that institutions have that we don't talk about, but that we reward very heavily on a day to day basis, right? So, for example, most of the research that we do in my lab is really centered on, you know, how American universities and, you know, for the most part, public classrooms are not culturally neutral. In fact, they're really culture specific places that. Preference a certain way of being and thinking. And largely that reflects more independent norms, right? So, this idea of being self expressive, being an independent learner, being independently motivated. And that's new for a lot of students who come from communities in which they're very connected to their families, connected to their communities, where they've learned to adjust to their environment, right? So, this idea in classrooms where we reward students who are the ones who speak out the most, for some students, learning happens as sort of a more kind of passive reserve process, right? So, we're missing that opportunity to reach those students. And to assess them in a different way. Those things are more subtle. So when I think about the cultural transition, I'm thinking about students who have to make this shift of their daily life being with family and community to being in a context where they're largely told that they should be independent, but independent in a really specific way. Because our work kind of unpacks independence as well. And I think that's really interesting. But independent in the sense that, you know, you should own your own ideas. You should you should have freedom. You should express yourself. And for students, that's, that's a difficult transition to make because often it doesn't leave room for the same important. Commitments to family, right? And so I think that's where I think about faculty being able to share their stories, but also in hopes to restructure, right, our learning context, what we value in the university to better incorporate what students are actually bringing with them, right? And, it, and it's not independence all the time, it's, it's interdependence, right? It's connection. And do you think being on a 10 week quarter system exacerbates some of these cultural challenges you're talking about? Yeah, right, because students now are left in, in many times alone, right? And so they're expected to reach out, and many do because、I've, I work with students who are incredibly resourceful, but it's quick. There's not this time to sort of unpack not only just, again, the bureaucratic things, but now I'm going through this identity shift, right? And I can't talk about it at home necessarily. My new peers might not actually understand what I'm going through, but if I had a community of first gen faculty, Peers and faculty who understood it, then within a 10 week frame, maybe that can feel just a little less isolating, right? A little less stressful. And I think that's what's really the importance of the connection.
information here. You are listening to Dr. Rebecca Gobarubias, Assistant Professor of Psychology from UC Santa Cruz. She's part of the hashtag First Generation Faculty Campaign that's happening throughout the UC system. And she's also the lab director of the Culture and Achievement Collaborative here at UC Santa Cruz. So tell us a little bit more about your lab, this Culture and Achievement Collaborative. What is it about and what are you trying to research and achieve through this lab? You know, so when I first started the lab, I invited about 10 undergraduate students to really build the culture of the research lab. And, you know, generally what we're about is trying to figure out how particular learning contexts can mismatch and delegitimize particular students, right? So marginalized students. I work a lot with students who are of low income backgrounds, first generation backgrounds, and also students of color. And so we try to unpack the features of the learning environment that render particular groups of students invisible, right, in many ways. And then once we have that information, we really try to think about and sort of brainstorm ways to reframe those learning contexts to then better serve students, right? So usually often through culturally informed approaches. Right, So how can we bring family back? How can we bring community back into those spaces? And what's interesting is that over time, because most of my lab now, we have about 13 undergraduate students and three graduate students, and all the students are either first gen of low income background or students of color. So interestingly, on this campus, campus it's also become a counter space, right? So it's not only that we're engaging in research and finding voice through the research and students are engaging in this, but they've also come and as a collective shared their experiences, what it's like to be on this campus. And it's a firm mean i think that's really what's great about the lab is that it can serve multiple purposes for students um, and they can find family and are you finding any differences amongst the students and the populations that you're studying as part of the lab are you finding differences for first generation students in say liberal arts private institutions versus these large public institutions like in the uc or are you finding there's a lot of overlap with the challenges that they're having yeah, I've been at a few different institutions and I can only really speak good to them and I've had some collaborations in different types as well. Um, so I've mostly been at large public research one institutions, but I've also now been in Hispanic serving institutions and predominantly white institutions that serve very little first gen populations. And largely, it, I mean, it does make a difference. So I'm fortunate enough to be, I think, and I'm, I'm proud that UCSC now is starting these initiatives, but also has other programming in place where students can go if that identity is not being served, but being served in other programs. And that was not the case at other institutions I've been at. So mostly the services or support came through one-on-one interactions because there weren't established programs in place for students. And and that makes all the difference, I think, in terms of helping students feel like they belong and can actually succeed there. So I think there are differences. I think part also with this visibility campaign is to bring some awareness to that and to show that there's a need and importance for integrating this within the cultural fabric of universities so that regardless if you're at a liberal arts, a public institution, a research one, the need is there. So when I was reading about your lab, it talked about how the research you're doing is in quote unquote health and school context. I get a sense of what the school means because you're talking about first generation college students. But what do you mean by the health context? In general, what I sort of mean in terms of health context, when I was a graduate student, I was also working on how we can look at bias and stereotyping, for example, in health context. So meaning like one project we looked at was how nursing and medical students have bias against particular groups. But in this case, we looked at Native American and Latinx um, patients. Um, So in in that, but I guess now with the first gen line of work or work that we're doing here at UC Santa Cruz, what we're really interested in is how this sort of cultural mismatches, right? And this idea of having to care for family while also navigating this independent space of the university, what impact does that have on mental health, right, or on physical health? And so we're extending it a little bit that way, but generally in the past, I've looked at just how bias and stereotyping and visibility occurs within health-based contexts. So it's not lost, I think, on a lot of us that as the university itself is diversifying, we experience these pretty profound budget cuts. In the UC system, we had these budget cuts happening in 2008, so I know before you arrived. Tell us how these budget cuts are affecting the educational issues that you care about, that you are studying when it comes to first-generation college students. Yeah, this is a critical issue. I think often when we experience budget cuts, the very first programs to be cut are the social programs, the financial programs, the critical career development programs that serve the students that need it the most. Um, and I sort of speak from experience. So when I was an undergraduate student, I'm, I'm a trio, I'm a trio kid, right? So trio are federally funded programs along the educational pipeline that serve underrepresented students. And so I was in a retention program, for example, that helped me really pair not only the social but financial aspects 
Roberts, but it gave me a peer mentor and it helped me really navigate the university system. But then I also joined Ronald E. McNair program that really, this was what really transformed me right into a scientist. It was my first chance of engaging in research that made sense to me, that made sense to my community and to my family. And it was the first time I can envision myself as being a scientist. And it's these programs that are often cut, right? So at my institution, we they lost the McNair program, but recently were refunded, which is really great. But the damage that it does, I think, to cut these types of programs, I think is long lasting. And um, we don't give students the proper support, the proper development to see themselves in different careers, right? In different um, ways of being. So I think, again, these programs really offer different types of representations for students. And then also, when you think about other programs like resource centers, so when my university experienced a budget cut, resource centers were the first things to go, but often that's the first place that students talk about as a source of support. So there's a disconnect between what students are valuing and potentially what we can prioritize when budget cuts do happen. I asked this question of Professor Leonardo last week, and I want to ask it of you. What kind of educational system should we be striving for as California residents, as concerned citizens, as UC professors, and as UC students? In other words, what is your dream educational environment? That's so awesome. Like, I think <laughs> this is like the, the ideal question, right, for people who do this work and, and for educators, I think, more generally. You know, I'll say that I think there's been an increasingly amount of conversations around culturally relevant pedagogy, teaching, advising, right, um, learning context, making sure that we're recreating these interactions that's, that are relevant to the students' backgrounds. And I think that's very exciting. And I think it's gaining more momentum. But I also think that there's maybe an idea, and, and authors have really written about this, but this idea of moving toward also culturally sustaining environments, right? So for example, how can we ensure that students still learn about their own culture, right? So not just making it relevant, but continuing their their learning about themselves, about their own culture. And I think it's a little bit different. And I think that's where I think we can switch a little bit to in terms of, so what curriculum are we building? What what artifacts are we using? What language are we using in order to make sure that students are learning? And I think there's great models of this, right? So ethnic studies courses do this really well, where they incorporate students' history right issues that impact their communities and students benefit greatly from this because they can learn more about who they are especially in places that don't really teach that so I think ideally it'd be a place where we can sustain students culture right so not just make it relevant for them but help them actually learn more about it and I think we have examples here on campus that do this really well right with our Hispanic Serving Institute initiatives and I think the points that you're raising here also signal to us that it's not just a benefit for the first-gen student themselves. It's a benefit, actually, for the entire campus community to learn about these issues. Don't you agree? I absolutely agree. I think, especially it's, if it's one of our, if going maybe soon to be one of our largest groups on campus, it's important for everybody to be aware of what these students are encountering. But also, learning about diversity, I think, is just generally good for, for people, especially as we go more into these shifts nationally, as our minority groups become the majority group. It offers a different skill set. It offers a different way of interacting with groups. And so it gives us at least some practice of learning how to engage in different diverse conversations. Now, I think that's probably scary to certain communities, right? I mean, we're also in Santa Cruz and we're in California, but it's stunning to me sometimes listening and watching the news and people genuinely frightened about population demographic changes. And so I'm thinking if anyone from there is listening, they're probably right now freaking out about what you're saying. What's interesting is that social psychology research actually documents this fear. And so they do this really cool work where they have folks come in um, into the lab and they read something about demographic shifts, right? It's sort of as a control condition and another condition they read about the majority minority shift and then they measure um, sort of fear-based attitudes and what you find generally is that when folks are kind of primed about this shifting in minority majority status that they report in this case they were interested in anti-black attitudes and that those attitudes go up right so people do show fear responses to this because I think generally it's about you know conflict of resources and then these sort of nasty narratives come by because I think that's how people cope with these things but if we can start early by engaging people in these sort of integrative conversations conversations, I think maybe we can work toward reducing some of that fear. And part of that, of course, is just people have to have an open heart to be willing to (laughs) sort of hear much of what you're talking about here as well. I mean, when you ask me about my sort of ideal educational environment, I talk about like the importance of these culturally sustaining things. But a big part of that is just, I think you're right, it's about just being caring as educators and and wanting to know more about our students' lives holistically. There's a really great TED Talk by Rita Pearson. And one of the lines that she says is that, you know, students don't learn from people they don't like. And it's just that simple that if it's really, and it seems really basic, but I think we're still not there where educators are caring enough to support their students. But many are, right? But I think generally that's just a 
common, I think, thing that we can work toward, right, as an institution and, and as classrooms. Now, I know you were born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'd like to get your reaction to what happened over the summer with a presidential pardon of Sheriff Arpaio. What did this mean to your family? What did this mean to people that you're in touch with in the community to have this be the first presidential pardon? You know, I have to say that this crosses some of our earlier conversation about being first gen. So honestly, in my family, we never really talk about political beliefs and and ideas. And so it was funny because I was there this summer when Trump came for the rally at the Phoenix Convention Center. And interestingly, my dad dropped me off, but most of their first initial reaction wasn't really supporting that decision, but it was mostly just about my safety, right? So they were just, they were more worried about that than anything else. But I think it's because there's a common practice, at least in our family, that we don't talk about our political beliefs. So it was an interesting thing to not talk about it, but then to them see me actually go to the protest. And I've had many students talk about this reality of, especially as they come to Santa Cruz, that they they develop more strongly sort of social justice beliefs and agendas. And, and sometimes it can feel like a disconnect from family. But when I was at, you know, I'll say a couple of things when I was at the protest in the rally. So two things that were really easily sort of noticeable were that there were such large groups of people from diverse backgrounds there. And there was something really incredible about seeing these protesters there because it's it seemed like there was a community coming together and filing calling out Arizona for the racism that has existed for a long time and still exists. And so it was really great to see just the large groups of people there, especially in Arizona, because it's often you, you get sort of have the assumption that maybe there's not people that really feel that way. So it was great to see that. The second thing I would say is that how many of those people were youth and, and just young people was incredible. We've heard a lot of stories, I think nationally, but even in Arizona where youth are organizing walkouts from schools and movements of resistance. And it was really evident there. So I think largely there's a side of course to the community where there's anger but there's hope and there's a sense that we need to come together to make our voices heard and a lot of that are youth doing that of course you saw the other side and I think that's what makes it a little bit hard especially when you put them together it was actually really kind of an awful experience to see almost like a catwalk of Trump supporters and it almost like let me show you how much I'm supporting so it was an interesting kind of dynamic there but I was glad to see how much support there was in resistance well thank you so much Rebecca for coming on Voces Criticas today. To learn more about the hashtag First Generation campaign, you can email firstgen at ucsc.edu. You can hear all shows of Critical Voices on our website, criticalvoices.sites.ucsc.edu. And you can email us at kcsc.voices at gmail.com.